Welcome to the last of these eight lectures. Uh, we're going to look at, of course, the topic is now globalization and next steps in missions. Uh, in your textbook, hopefully you've already read that 13th chapter, and I'm going to follow the chapter more with this lecture than any lecture I've done previously as uh, we actually look at the next steps. Hopefully you've already viewed the, uh, the spot there from Red Square there in Moscow. And uh, so what's next? Uh, what, what will the next year, decade, uh, 50 years, if our Lord tarries, uh, entail for global missions? Uh, well, sociologists uh, give us some input to say these are the trends that are happening. Uh, population growth, for example, is unprecedented. Uh, again, the book points out, and just to give a uh, kind of a flow of history, in the year 1800, there were, were one billion people uh, on planet Earth. Not that long ago. Uh, in 1900, 1.6 billion people. 2000, 6 billion. So in 100 years, you see the huge growth, 1.6 billion to 6 billion, even obviously in our lifetime. Currently, about 7.6 billion people reside on planet earth. If our Lord delays his return by the year 2030, estimates say about eight and a half billion people. By 2050, 9.7 billion. And by the end of this century, again, if our Lord tarries, over 11 billion people. And so again, you see exponential growth in a population. And that affects many things. One is urbanization. Again, just a couple hundred years ago, in the year 1800, about 3% of the world was urban then. So vastly rural, 97%. Uh, by 1900, 14% of the world's population lived in cities. By 1950, that doubled. 30% of the world lived in cities. Uh, 2008 was the tipping point where over half of the world now lives in cities. Uh, in fact, 2017, about 55 percent, with the projection by 2050, again, if our Lord delays, uh, over 70 percent of the world's population will be in cities. And, and that does affect how we reach, where we deploy, uh, how we interact with people. And your book pointed out that uh, other influencing uh, ramifications. One is secularization. There on page 253, that uh, now the need for spiritual conversion is uh, is intolerance. To tell somebody that they're separated from God, and if things don't change, they're literally on their way to an, an eternal hell. Uh, that is an affront. Uh, in fact, there's discussion that that may be illegal. Uh, at the very least, obviously, that's considered intolerant. Uh, I mentioned when I talked about the world religions a few weeks ago that the largest one segment of the U.S. society, as they self-identify, call themselves nuns, uh, none of the above, no affiliation. And so secular expression of a religion is syncretism. And what's happening, what's become popular, and there's a, a huge church here in Houston, obviously, that uh, the preacher basically tells the people what they want to hear and so, uh, you know, life is great, you'll be prosperous, you'll get the new car. And uh, it has very little or nothing to do with Scripture and nothing to do with the gospel. And uh, yet that becomes a new expression, even calling themselves Christians and Christianity. But uh, it's obviously ineffective and it has no heart change and uh, there really is no future hope. And so secularization is, uh, is only going to be on the rise, the rise of world religions. Again, as uh, there's mob mobile uh, peoples, mobile mobility among families, some seeking job, economic betterment, some fleeing situations, refugees. But uh, now there's becoming more integration, uh, culture, butting up against culture. That's why you see the hostilities right now in parts of Europe with so many immigrants, refugees coming in. And some, for some, the first exposure to another uh, belief system, a world religion, and so you're, you're seeing a resurgence as uh, many settle in other countries. Uh, all of a sudden, they want to express their religion, their uh, faith, as it were. Uh, just recently, I was up in Detroit, Michigan, preaching, 
and again, a huge Muslim uh, population there in Dearborn, and uh, just the ramifications, not only religious-wise, but culturally in, uh, in that part of the United States. So a resurgence of world religions. Uh, also, a big topic is missionary access. Uh, with the urbanization, with the modernization, uh, there was this thought that, okay, as we become more, quote, civilized, whatever that means, that there will be a freer flow of ideas back and forth, but that's, that's not true, especially in uh, predominantly Muslim context, Middle East, other places. Uh, there are places where there's not even access, where we can't even live as uh, Christians. Sometimes it's simply as Americans. We're not welcomed in certain countries. And so the question there is, does the Great Commission say go into all the world where you're welcomed? Well, obviously no. Does it say go into all the world where they want a blue passport, where Americans welcome? No, uh, it doesn't. And so actually for probably 20 years, we've looked at, uh, it was early called non-residential missionaries, where people couldn't live in country, but they could travel. And so there are creative ways to go in. Uh, even today, we talk about creative access. In certain countries, you can't be a missionary, uh, but you can run a travel agency. You can be a teacher. You can find other uh, jobs or, uh, or practices or legal ways to stay in a country. And then you use that platform, as it were, a tent maker to, uh, to share the gospel. And so the question of access is becoming more and more of a challenge uh, even in my organization, the International Mission Board, probably when we went uh, 27 years ago, I don't know if maybe 10%, 20% of our personnel would have been high security uh, on platforms. Uh, well, today is probably 60% and growing in percentage of our personnel who have to be on other platforms to even legally reside in their country of service. And so the book points that out as well, and that is a, a very real part of uh, the coming expression uh, of missions work. Well, the book poses a question, what needs to change for missions to impact the billions of today and tomorrow? And there are some very basic paradigmatic changes. Uh, really, it's not tweaks, you know, we just need to do this a little better. It's going to be wholesale changes. Again, our organization financially is flat, and uh, the projection is will be flat for the next decade, if not longer. And so we do have to be creative. How do we bring others to the field to join our teams where there are no funds? And so obviously they can find a job. There may be other funding sources. And so what are some basic changes? Well, the book points out, first, a new type of sending church. Uh, I like the statement that lukewarm Christianity does not export well. Uh, sadly, in the United States, in the Western Church, uh, there has been a settling for decisions over disciples for generations now. Uh, we have watered down the gospel to say, you know, if you come forward, you repeat these words, or you agree, do you agree that Jesus died for your sins? Do you, we just go through three or four checkpoints, check, check, and sometimes it's a five-year-old or an eight-year-old, and they say, yes, 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 I don't want to go to hell, I want to go to heaven, repeat these words. And there's no discipleship. There's no growing in grace. There's no understanding of uh, taking up a cross, which literally means dying to self. And so if that is what we're exporting, it is no more palatable in the soil across the world than it really is in our soil. And so the sending churches of America must change. There must be this grappling with biblical discipleship, with the cost uh, you know, there are missionaries who are being killed, and obviously the ultimate cost, and yet are we willing as churches here to send if we know that that is a reality, that is a possibility? And so the new type of sending church, uh, and even there has been a shift, that today as churches in the Southern Baptist Con uh, Convention approve candidates, there is a greater sense of responsibility not just to, to give a recommendation or a reference, but to go alongside, maybe send uh, volunteer teams, maybe ongoing contact through Skype or other methods to uh, encourage, to be accountability partners, as it were. And so it's going to take a stronger church base in America for the future of missions to thrive. 
Uh, it's going to take a new type of missionary. Uh, in the past, predominantly what we did was we sent pastors. We sent ministers, church staff people. And there's still a place. That, that is my background. Uh, but there's going to emerge, and there already is emerging, a, a new type of missionary, uh, an IT specialist. Uh, there's someone on my team, her background was a travel agent. And uh, so a lot of times these other experiences, abilities, trainings will give the person access to one of these platforms, and they use that to, to have legal status. And then, of course, through that, they are multiplying disciples, starting churches, and training leaders. And so we have to, to revisit what does a missionary look like? What are the steps of preparation? What's training? Uh, what does it need to be like? Uh, both in the local church and then in organizations. How do we train people uh, for security purposes? How do we prepare them to be interrogated? I mean, there, there are more things than simply understanding the gospel and even understanding Paul's principles of church planning. It, it goes far beyond that. Uh, there is a generational challenge uh, under this same topic. Uh, some people talk about, well, millennials, uh, they're, they're not going to stay anywhere more than five years. I personally don't buy that. Uh, I think it's just the continual casting of a vision that's greater than we are. Uh, because if, if God calls someone to stay somewhere for 30 years and they leave in five years, that's not a generational problem. That's a sin problem. And so it's really, are we going to obey uh, the Lord? And it's going to take a missionary who's going to say, I'm going to stay here till God leads me to leave. If that's five years, it's five years. If it's 30 years, uh, it's 30 years. So we need a generation that's going to be on mission uh, and to begin that lifestyle, even in the States. Uh, some people joke about uh, missions or, or missions changed by aviation, that uh, somehow you get on an airplane and while you're in the States, you don't share your faith, but you, you get off a plane over there and all of a sudden you do. And that's false. Uh, people who don't share their faith in America, they tend to not share their faith uh, in Poland or Indonesia or anywhere else in the world. So a, a new type of missionary. Uh, the third one is a global shift of the mission base. And uh, we use the word now globalization of missions. Uh, up until the last half century, missions has almost always flowed west to east and north to south. And so uh, early on, England and the continent, that would have been the locus, the uh, the foundation for mission sending, and then it shifted to America, and uh, it still is to a large degree, but it's changing very rapidly. Uh, mission organizations out of Korea, South Korea, obviously, uh, Brazil, uh, in my part of the world, Ukraine, Russia, uh, other the Philippines, Nigeria, their missions, missionaries are going from everywhere to everywhere. Uh, I saw the recent statistic about a half a million, about 500,000 missionaries, Christian missionaries, were sent last year. Now, again, I believe that takes into consideration those who are going short term, two weeks, two months, as well as those who are going long term, fully funded, uh, career, long time, anticipated service. And so again, we, we need to understand that part of our role as Western Christians, as the United States, is not only to send missionaries, but to help others send missionaries. Uh, one of my associates is very much involved. In fact, not just him, but several of my co-workers are very involved in fanning the flame and helping with training others how to train, even setting up organizationally. How do you uh, bring in funding from numerous sources, different churches like our cooperative program system? And if some want to follow that, some want to, to use some version of that. And so the future of missions is going to include globalization, where our partners, and, and again, we need to understand those mission fields become mission bases. Uh, and in fact, as we raise up disciples in places where we serve, to be true disciples, they need to understand they have a responsibility to take the gospel to all the world. They're not just receiving missionaries, but they need to come to the place where they realize they need to send missionaries. Uh, of course, that's going to be a small scale starting, but obedience begins 
small, like yeast, even Jesus said. And then it begins to grow and to permeate. And so globalization is definitely a huge part of, uh, of the mission's future. Uh, in fact, in much of the world, we can't even get there with a platform. Uh, probably the most extreme example is North Korea. Um, though sometimes the joke is that we can actually get in. It's just getting out that's a problem. But uh, we, we help train Koreans who get out, and some of them go back in. Chinese can travel in more easily. And so many times we train Chinese believers. And so, again, that would be an example. In the Middle East, uh, what we've discovered, sometimes South American missionaries from Brazil, to use an example, can go into the Middle East and uh, sometimes physically they, they look more like Middle Easterners than maybe we do. Uh, sometimes culturally they don't have the baggage uh, as imperialist or, or whatever world power that some would throw at us and they can kind of go in under the radar. Um, Russians can get into other communist countries usually more easily. Uh, they have that common heritage. And again, they're not a threat in that sense. And so it is amazing what God is doing today from missions from these former mission receiving places to, uh, to becoming mission sending. Uh, one just neat example recently, uh, again in Ukraine, in the uh, eastern part of the country, there have been hostilities uh, between Russians and Ukrainians uh, now going on over three years. And uh, many have been bombed out of their places. Over a million Ukrainians have moved into Poland, where I live. And that is the tendency as they flee, the war-torn area is to move to the west. But there was a pastor there in eastern uh, Ukraine, the Donetsk, Lugansk area. And uh, he realized he was going to have to evacuate his family. They have several children. And uh, as they opened up a map, instead of looking to the west, they looked to the east. He, he speaks Russian, Ukrainian. And so he looked, and out in the middle of Russia, Udmurtia, uh, he just prayed and saw, uh, looking at how many churches uh, Evangelical churches were in different parts of Russia, and it was one of the most sparsely represented places. And so he moved his family near Izhevsk, Russia. But what he didn't know, but God was obviously orchestrating, is we already had two families there, and they were planting a church, and they're already starting actually a second church, but they were needing leaders. And here this brother shows up with a heart for the Lord and immediately begins to pastor a new church and to help start other churches. And so again, we see how the Lord is using his family from all over the world to reach those who still haven't heard. And so globalization is a huge part, quote, next step in missions. Uh, the fourth point there is diaspora missions. Uh, saw this statistic, over 10% of the population of developed countries were born elsewhere. Uh, today, Toronto, Canada is virtually 50-50, about half of this mega city, uh, they were born in another country. And so this is a huge opportunity. Uh, again, the estimate there, about 250 uh, million international migrants worldwide. About the population of Indonesia, 250 million. U.S. population is about 325 million. So again, a substantial amount of people. And so the question is, will the church in these places where these immigrants, these refugees are coming, will it be truly the church across ethnic lines, cultural, religious, linguistic? Uh, again, this university uh, is located in Houston, recently named the most diverse city in America. Uh, 140 different countries, 345 different people groups uh, reside in this city, 220 different languages. Uh, are we fulfilling the Great Commission here in our own backyard? And that's a part of the face of missions to come, is the whole diaspora missions. Uh, and then fifthly, new technologies. Uh, the, the church has often looked at science and technology with suspicion, uh, at best sometimes with derision, and yet uh, the, the future of missions is going to have to embrace, uh, and is embracing, uh, I've heard amazing stories how people walk through Muslim markets, and I don't even understand technology that well, but they can have it with them a device that will actually download onto phones uh, clips of the Jesus film or stories from the Bible. 
and uh, then they can monitor. And literally hundreds of thousands of Muslims are going online to see the stories from the Bible in their language, but they can do it in the privacy of their home and, and no one knows. And so technology is going to be a huge part of uh, getting the gospel out, especially to uh, illiterate peoples uh, through story, through music, through, uh, through these different avenues. Well, how can you begin engaging uh, this diverse city or wherever it is that you live? Uh, and again, the book there on page uh, actually 27 goes on to talk about open your eyes. Uh, it's a picture of praying, prayer walking your neighborhood. Open your heart, uh, learning to love your neighbor, your neighborhood, your city, as God is leading so many to this city. Uh, I know of people that have uh, intentionally moved to an apartment complex where they can begin a ministry and even start a church in uh, that apartment complex. Open your door. Mercy Ministries. Uh, Post-Hurricane Harvey gave great opportunities to, uh, to show the love of Christ in tangible ways. Open your mouth. Uh, speak. The Bible says faith comes by hearing uh, and hearing by the word of Christ. And so, yes, there is the place to, to speak the truth, to speak the gospel even as we're showing the gospel through tangible ways. Uh, again, there, there's so much more to teach than uh, I have time in these eight fairly brief lectures. Uh, but, but what have we covered in these eight weeks? Well, we looked at the biblical basis of missions. Uh, hopefully you spent many hours uh, researching both the scriptural record and, uh, and current missiologist writings to, to write your paper as a, uh, Missions is the backbone theme of Scripture. It's not a peripheral uh, teaching that's out there on the side somewhere. Uh, we looked at the theological and historical foundations of missions, that they build on one another. Uh, we looked at the lives of 15 pivotal missionaries and the impact that they had and the practices that they introduced, some of the mistakes they made as well as some of the successes. We surveyed world religions and uh, the pluralistic world in which we live, and the ever-changing and uh, clashing of cultures and religions. We looked at contextualization, which is a huge uh, topic for us. Uh, how can we make our witness authentic and relevant without compromising that which the, the Bible would call essential and uh, what is unessential in maybe uh, the way it's dressed in, uh, in the part of the world in which you and I have, uh, have grown up. Uh, we reviewed the priority of planting churches for Christianity to take root, that we make disciples, but disciples need to gather and become communities so that they can make disciples and gather and become communities. So church planting is essential to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Uh, we dialogued about basic mission strategies, how to make multiplying disciples, groups, churches, and leaders. We looked at the four fields about just a basic approach that the Bible gives us to see step by step how we move toward the, uh, the starting of churches and the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And uh, then today we looked at trends, what is on the horizon and possibly over the horizon, and the globalization of missions and how God is calling up missionaries from everywhere to everywhere. Uh, I've enjoyed the journey together. I said at the very beginning that my hope is not simply to impart information, but to, to begin a lifestyle change and lifelong journey that would be missional in purpose. And, and I close with a story. Leighton Ford, a uh, Christian writer, uh, shared the story. I don't know if it originated with him, but he tells of, of an imaginary council that was held many years ago uh, in the bowels of hell. And the demons came together because Jesus had just resurrected and uh, they didn't know what to do. And so they began to throw out ideas and to brainstorm. And one said, well, let's just deny that it happened. Let's spread lies and rumors. And uh, in the story, Satan says, well, but the truth will come out. And another gave his idea and another. And finally, a, a wise and crafty serpent said, well, let's say that the resurrection happened. And then there was a big murmur and, and Satan said, let him finish. He said, but let us say that people have all the time in the world to respond to it. And they will just become complacent. And some believe that is the tact that uh, our adversary has taken. That uh, the message of Christ 
is not new in our country. Uh, it probably is not new to you. But is there the urgency that this generation needs to hear, not just in Houston, but in all, in all the world? Because when that happens in the church, we will see the fulfillment of the Great Commission. My prayer is that you will find your place in that journey.